Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Writer's Chat. We are so glad to have you with us, whether you're right here right now on this wonderful Tuesday morning or if you're watching the replay. I am Johnny Alexander. I'm joined by co-hosts Brandy Bro and Melissa Stroh, and I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to introduce our special guest for today. Hi, everyone. And well, I get the privilege of introducing our very good friend and fellow Writers Chat community member, Sophia Hansen. I know a lot of you do know her in the, in the chat and, and with us today, but for those who don't, I'm going to share her bio with you. Sophia L. Hansen is an author and editor with Havoc Publishing and loves to write in other worlds. She's lived on a tiny island in Alaska, the bustling cities of New York and Boston, raised kids in Tennessee, and now resides just outside Birmingham, Alabama. After 30 plus years of marriage, seven children, and numerous pets, Sophia still fits into her high school earrings. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have Sophia's uh, website and Facebook and social connections, and we'll share those with you guys in the chat. We'd love for you to follow and support her. And today she's going to be sharing with us about the fundamentals of flash fiction. Thank you, Sophia, for joining us today. We're excited to hear about this topic. I'm going to start with sharing this picture. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Um, for those who can't see the tiny print, it's a picture of a clothesline with laundry drying. And one woman is telling the other, it dries the washing using the very latest technology a combination of wind and solar power. So, um, and I thought that that image kind of captured the concept of what flash fiction is. Um, it seems like a new and alien concept, but it's been around a lot longer than you think. In fact, the first flash fiction contest was inspired by a journalist's query, how short can a short story be and still be a short story? As a result, Short Stories from Life was published in 1916, featuring 81 stories from the shortest story contest. Some of the other questions that were raised as the project grew were, when is a story not a story, but only an anecdote? When is a story a story? No, when a story is a story, is it a combination of plot, character, and setting, or is it determined by only one of these three elements? Um, and another question they considered was, must the story end when you've ended it, or must it suggest something further beyond the reading? Mm. These are still some of the questions we ask as we consider flash fiction. But let's clarify, what is this beast? Flash fiction is a form of a short story that usually falls between a length of 300 to 1,000 words. There are shorter forms. Microfiction is less than 300 words, and nanofiction is less than 100 words. But we'll be focusing on what is popularly referred to as flash. Um, and if you give it a shot, you'll find, like any villain in a trope-laden climax declares, it's not really so different. Um, I guess my first question is, why should you write flash fiction? First, it's a good way to get past writer's block. Um, and writing prompts are a fun way to jumpstart those creative juices. Second, you get to play with a new story. Um, and you have the rush of finishing in far less time than you might with a 90,000 word novel. You will learn to write and edit tighter, and you'll have content or lead magnets to offer your followers. And finally, getting published is not as arduous as or stretched out as it might be with um, a series <laughs> or a novel. I should clarify though, publishing flash fiction is not an automatic score. Some months we may receive up to 30 submissions for the four or five available slots for that month. Other times we have only eight submissions, but the air barrier to entry is not as steep as it could be for a full length novel. So um, let's get down to business. Unless there are, are there any questions? 
Um, I'm not seeing any so far. Good, okay. So every story needs a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's gonna be the case with this talk. It's true whether your story is spread out over a seven book series or a 50 word fiction. You need a beginning that will hook your reader, a middle that will engage them, and a satisfying ending. That's not so different, is it? But you need to do that in 1,000 words. <laughs> now, I'm going to um, put this in the chat. There, for the plotters in the room, um, I have a little structure here. I can't say that I use it because I'm pretty committed to pantsing, but um, for people who plot, this might be helpful. Let's see if I can get over there. Boom. There. There's your base, basic plot structure. Um, your intro should take about 150 words for the setting and the characters. They recommend that you start in the middle of the crisis. Um, the rising action is about 600 words, where you develop your main con conflict, your tri-fails or your conflict crisis. Your climax is about 200 words. That's the turning point and where it gets most intense. And then finally, your resolution could take about 50 words. Um, 50 words to make it satisfying. On the other hand, it could be just one sentence. Havoc the organization I edit with um, publishes free speculative flash fiction in five different genres throughout the week. We have Mystery Monday, Techno Tuesday, Wacky Wednesday, Thriller Thursday, and Fantasy Friday. I serve on their Techno Tuesday team of editors. And as we sift through the science fiction submissions, this is what we look for and what we aim to develop in the stories we accept. Beginning, let's start there. Pay attention to submission requirements. I want to do in sign language, pay attention. <laughs> this should go without saying for any submission process, but it's not uncommon for an author to skim them and then forget what's been plainly stated in the rush to push send. Um, second, Make your title earn its keep. They're not include, included in your word count, so take advantage of that. It's like a little cheat. Use it to set the stage or foreshadow a twist. Then your first line needs to hook your reader. I'm going to read a couple of first lines. Um, there are things they don't tell you about having green skin. That's from Photosynthetic by Cassandra Ham, And then non-existent shocks, non shocks collide with Boston's finest potholes as the cab barrels down Newberry Street. That's from Trumpet Blues by me. <laughs> um, those first lines need to get your attention because a five minute read shouldn't be that long to, to get through, but your readers expect to be transported immediately into your story. Um, in your beginning, keep a thought of the end. Um, how are you going to wrap this up? What is the twist you're pointing at? Um, pay attention to your point of view and your voice, whether it's first, second, or third. All of those voices do work in flash fiction, but you need to be consistent. Um, limit your characters to just one or two. You will need the conflict of opposing forces, but too many characters are difficult to address appropriately within a thousand words. And then finally, let us feel your world. Um, and make sure that the features you introduce are also pertinent. Um, so here's a wonderful opening. Um, Commander Triek's ship was self-destructing. Bianca muttered Earth, Earth English curses under her breath as she ran through the Argo's gigantic ventilation shafts, holding our gigantuan stolen ring of shiny black electrical tape 
around her waist like a life ring. She had spent three precious hours tracing the problem to the engine maintenance room. She couldn't afford to be wrong. That's from Brownie Points by Lavender Ellington. Um, I love that opening. Right, a, right away, you know, you're on an alien ship and it's self-destructing. You know that the main character is from Earth. And apparently the electrical tape on this ship is big enough to fit around her waist. I will tell you that the brown, the title Browning Points was almost misleading because I was convinced this character was a fairy tale brownie, um, given the setting, but the character said no, she was on a ship where the aliens were actually that much larger. But it was a great story and she did a great setup. Can I make a, so a any questions yeah. at the beginning? Um, I love, as you read that, the richness of the language, because it seems to, because we all know that when you show something, instead of telling it, it takes more words. And I would think it would be quite the temptation to keep in that word count to tell and not show. And yet you've done an excellent example of showing. I mean, this, this author is still showing, not, not telling. And not only showing, she's letting you get that feeling. That last sentence in the intro, she couldn't afford to be wrong. You get that feeling of impending doom. I love impending doom. <laughs> um, get <clears throat> the middle. Um, it's talking. I, I was thinking about dialogue. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Um, dialogue can flesh out your story in ways that a report or a lot of detail can't, um, especially if you can use action beats to reveal more about your character than a dialogue tag might. Um, I'll warn you, my critique partner, David here, has asked me occasionally to throw in just a straight up tag <laughs> because I, I avoid them like the plague. <laughs> but, um, that then you want to reveal, not lecture. That's a different way of saying show, don't tell. <laughs> um, and you can do that to great advantage with dialogue, with your action beats, with a feel um, in your story. And finally, in, your, in the body of your story, avoid the talking heads. Let the whole body communicate your character's sense of being the shoulders, the fingers, the knees, the toes, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Um, and then finally, I have another sh screen share I'm going to pull up. Um, boop. I should have planned that ahead of time. Here it is. Uh, there we go. Boop. So let's see if it'll go. Don't estimate the importance of body language. <laughs> I love that picture. So, <laughs> um, furthermore, in the middle, remember the story doesn't start until something goes wrong. And your readers need to care about that. There needs to be stakes and you need to know what's going to happen if the main character fails and failing is a viable option in these stories. Finally, <laughs> your ending, your ending needs to be satisfying and the conflict needs to be resolved, whether it's positive or negative for your main character. Leave your care your readers with a thought to chew on or a twist or an aha. The further question is, does this story convey an idea that is larger than itself? Um, one of the stories from, short stories from life, NB, written way back in 2016, gives the reader serious 
this pause with their twist ending. Um, and I'd actually like to read this to you. Let's go to, um, I can actually read it with you. Share the screen. Go to oh, where did it go? Oops, hold on. Um, oops, sorry about that. Here we go. This was a really moving story. So we're back to here. Share. I don't know why it's okay there. I'm trying to make this work. Sorry. No um, problem. That's not working. Okay, let's go. Boom, boom. Okay, is the story showing on your screen? We're seeing it with a lot of files. Okay, I'm going to go back. Stop share. Try this again. It seemed like there was text to the this side of this, like there was files and then text. And then, yeah. there, there go. we go. Because my eyes need the help. Maybe yours do too. That looks like okay. a good size for me. Great. Lieutenant Lodwig Kruzler glanced hurriedly through the mail that had accumulated during the month that the X-8 had been away from base. At the bottom of the file, he found a le the letter he had been seeking, and his eyes brightened. It was a fat letter, addressed in feminine handwriting, and its original postmark was Washington, D.C., USA. His Excellency will see you, sir. The orderly had ended quietly and stood at attention. With a slightly impatient shrug, the lieutenant shoved the letters into his pocket and left the room. He found Admiral von Herpitz, the Wizard of the Sea, at his desk. As the young man entered, the old Admiral rose and came forward. This unusual mark of favor somewhat embarrassed the young officer until the old man, placing both huge hands upon his shoulders, looked into his eyes. Excellent. The one word conveyed a volume of praise, gratification. The old sea dog was known as a silent man. Censure was more frequent from him than applause. The lieutenant could find no word. The situation for him was embarrassing in the extreme. He, like Herpitz, was a man of actions, and the words confused him. These English, the old admiral spoke grimly, we will teach them. Have you seen the reports? They are having quite a little panic in America, also over the Saronica. 200 of the passengers lost were American. A file of papers lay on the table. Chrysler ran through them hurriedly. The Berlin journals gave the sinking of the Saronica great headlines, followed by columns of sheer joy. The London and Paris and some of the New York sheets called the exploit a crime and its perpetrators pirates, but they all gave it utter and undivided thought. The X-8 had become the horror craft of the world. Berlin figuratively carried her young commander on her shoulders. He found himself the hero of the hour. You have done well for the fatherland, von Herpitz repeated as the lieutenant was going out. In his own cabin, Krusler forgot the Saronica and the X-8. The fat letter with the Washington postmark absorbed him. Two years ending the two years ending with the outbreak of the Great War, Krusler had been a naval attache to the German embassy at Washington. He had been popular in the society of the American capital. He was highly educated, a profound scientist, an original thinker, and an adaptable and interesting dinner guest. Dorothy Washington, the youngest daughter of the Senator from Oregon, had made her debut in Washington during the second winter of Chrysler's presence there. The two had met. They were exact opposites. He, tall, severe, blonde, thoughtfully serious. She, small, dark, vivacious, bubbling with the joy of life. Love was inevitable. The fat letter was engrossing. It breathed in every line and word and syllable. 
the fine love this wonder, wonder Woman gave him. One paragraph was most astounding. It read, to be near thee, loved one, I have arranged through the gracious kindness of our friends to come to Berlin as a nurse. Just when is as yet uncertain, but come I will, fear not, as quickly as may be. Dost long for me to see me, dearest heart, as I for thee? Well, soon perhaps that may not be so far away. Couldst thou now arrange to be wounded? Only slightly, of course, my love, so that I might attend thee. The letter ended with tender love messages and assurances of devotion. The last sheet bore a single word, over, and on the reverse side, a woman's most important news, a postscript. This read, P.S. Arrangements have been completed. Everything is settled. Even my father has consented, knowing of my great love. I sail next week. And then, N.B. Nota bene. The ship on which I sail is the Saronica. Doesn't that give you shudders? <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. And the foreshadowing was really building up for it. Yes, and the title, NB, I actually had to look that up because I didn't know, I knew it meant something like PS, but it means um, take note. It's a good, it's important. Um, and then that last sentence provides the twist. <laughs> Um, so many of the flash fiction stories I've read, especially from history, have ended their stories in a way that makes you view the whole story in a different light and want to reread it. So that is, is it not every writer's goal to have their readers want to reread and pour over their notes? Yeah. Um, I don't know if any of you remember the story to serve man. It was a movie. I mean, it was a little TV short, but it was also um, originally a story. Yeah. And the title was to serve man. And it was about aliens that descended and made everything better. They, they improved agriculture, they obliterated disease, they ended war. And there was only one person who was still su suspicious and he studied their goals and they said they were just there to serve man and he studied their works and at the very end he finally understood their writing and at the last line is don't you understand it's a cookbook <laughs> once again flipping the whole story <laughs> with one sentence at the end um your readers will want to know what's going to happen but they want to be surprised so end your stories with something that's been seeded through the beginning um, and throughout the story. Finally, follow-ups. When you're done, um, check your words for repeated, no, check your story for repeated words or concepts, any unnecessary details, and the death of all things cliches. <laughs> then read it out loud. You'll be surprised what you catch and then get someone else to look at it. Um, so that is what I have so far for what flash fiction is and what we editors are looking for. Any of these items will either push your story up or count against it when the competition gets tough. Um, do you have any recommendations to writers um, that want to try flash fiction, uh, particularly when it comes to word counts? Um, because I know that it can be really hard to get those stories down to a small word count. So what are your recommendations for how to do that and keep story? Um, well, that, that structure that I put in the comments earlier is helpful. Um, see if you're spending so much time. We sometimes get stories that have a lot of exposition in the beginning and we will take out not me i'm, I'm i don't usually do this because i'm nice <laughs> but we will cross out the first two or three cha chapters and say your story starts here um 
And I think it was Stephen James that said it. Your story starts when something goes wrong. So have something go wrong. That's what I love about the beginning of Brownie Points. Um, it starts with everything going wrong, but it goes wronger, which is what you want. And, um, so uh, what's the name of that program that I use? Uh, I'm drawing a complete blank. Someone help me here. It's a pro writing aid. Pro writing aid is really good for helping you address repeated words um, and phrases. That's where you find a friend who is is good at doing that. Um, someone who can slash and help you cut it down. Um, look for your weasel words, your jests. Um, avoid the phrases that are telling. I would have, I could have, she thought to herself, anything like that. Um, and you'll get used to it after a while. Um, also read flash fiction and you'll see how they get to the point quick, more quickly. Um, I'm going to list some places that you can submit or or pursue it. Um, of course, <laughs> I'm going to hawk havoc. I'll put this in the chat. Um, GoHavoc.com and you want to go to write for us. There's submissions and guidelines. Let's see if I can find the Zoom. Put that in the chat. Boom. Um, one of the great things about Havoc is that we edit all submissions unless you specifically request otherwise. So, um, there, oops, <laughs> I got a push sent. Um, and so you'll get a sent, so what we would cut to make it shorter. Yes, to, um, yes, I do have, um, right now, in fact, I want to encourage you to check out Sparks submission. Let me go to that one. Um, Spark is looking for flash. They're looking for fantasy romances for their next issue. And these submissions are open until July 22nd, but they do different themes throughout the year. And um, if you like to write romance, that's a great place to to submit. Um, another place that you can submit and get feedback in is NewYorkCityMidnight.com. They have contests. And I'm going to come here again. Boom. And they give you great feedback too. Now, they are not faith based, or that's not a faith based organization, but they, um, you write what you write. You don't, they don't penalize anybody. Um, they give you feedback on your entry, and you also have the opportunity in their community to submit your work and receive feedback from other submitters, which is wonderful. Pam asks, if you start with something going wrong, do you then have to go uh, go to backstory? Flash fiction is so short, I would think you'd want to avoid backstory. You can add in a little back backstory throughout. It, you don't want to have a huge backflash, but you can have a memory, you can have a voice in their head. You can give a little bit. Once one of the stories we just recently were working on, um, because often the person is in the crisis based on an action in their past. And so you can feed that throughout your story. One of our stories opened with, you'll never amount to anything. Running away is a coward's choice. And then this, that was her memory as she's struggling with an engine fire. This is another engine fire. Those are popular. <laughs> Nothing like an engine fire in space. But at the end, she, um, she tells herself that no matter what her mom says, she wasn't a coward. So 
in the story you just read there, I mean, it uses a little bit of backstory and it, I think, so that would be a good example to study because you've got all this information first and then it's the envelope from Washington that sort of propels you into the backstory. So it doesn't feel like an info dump. Yes, even the newspaper clippings. Yes. Yeah. That didn't feel like an info dump either, but it very easily could have been. Mm -hmm. I agree with what you said about reading. I mean, I think anything you want to to write, you should should read. And I think, I mean, it was interesting to me. I'm not sure how many words that one was that you read to us. Was it within the thousand words? It was actually far shorter. That was what amazed me. That one was 641 words, actually less because of the title and the author. Wow. So, I mean, that was amazing. That was a, that was a, a and there were wonderful words in it again. I mean, it, it's like you probably could have cut it even more if you truly wanted to, but it was taking out some of the lushness of it. But yeah, I mean, it it seems to me like if you read this that size that you want to write, you'll get a sense for how much you can include. Um, yeah. If you think that you can't write flash fiction because all you write are long novels, I discovered flash fiction written by Kafka <laughs> and Dickens. <laughs> and if ever there were long-winded writers, it would be those two. Stephen um, King started out with short stories. Beg your pardon? Stephen King started out with short stories. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, um, so... Okay, my friend Kathy McCrum, who's on here with us, said that brownie points, and I didn't know this because um, her daughter had used a pen name, that was the author of brownie points. So she just squealed at me on Messenger while I was reading that. <laughs> so you're, um, I was excited about that. It's a great story. Um, flash fiction stories are a great way to spice up your chapters. That's so true. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions. That's what I have as far as my presentation, I believe. Oh, well, I've, oh, there's also um, on Facebook, those I've mentioned Spark and Havoc and New York City Midnight. And those are great places to submit and receive feedback on your flash fiction. Um, a lot of the same principles of principles apply to writing blog posts. So if you like to write blog posts, you're probably well exercised in those. Um, there's also a community, the Flash Fiction Writers Guild on Facebook. So if you wanted to um, have places to bounce ideas or ask questions, that's a safe group to do that in. And finally, like I said, if you're curious about flash fiction, read it. There are plenty of free sources and they don't take more than a few minutes of your time. Um, so thank you. I am good for questions now. There's also um, a group on Facebook for finding short fiction submissions. Um, and it is called Open Call, if, particularly if you write science fiction and fantasy, Open Call, Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Pulp. It's not particularly Christian, but there are, are usually a lot of good calls on there. And there are other groups as well on Facebook that you can find uh, submission calls. Um, and then I'd also say places to find them might be a Duotrope. And if you'd like to write literary flash fiction, you can find things on Submittable. Okay, can you put those in the yep. chat? That would be great. Resources. You guys will want to save the chat today because there's a lot of things in there. Um, well, should we invite everyone on then, Sophia? Are you ready for us to do it? <laughs> Come on, please. We've got quite a crowd today, which is really fun. We're going to fill up the screen, tiny boxes. So yeah, come on in. And uh, so happy to see some people here we haven't seen in a while. So that's always fun too to, to welcome back friends. Uh, anyone have a question for Sophia or want to share a 
experience with writing flash fiction or any additional comments? If we did put you in writer's chat jail too, I don't know that we did anybody, but if we did and you can't get on, if your video is not working, let us know in the chat and we'll take care of that. I did put a few people in, so if there oh, are some, okay. I'll release you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna take a picture of all y'all. Please so. let us know. Okay. Uh, yeah, Pam. Just a comment that um, flash fiction is very, very similar to writing picture books. Mm. Like, People think you can't write a whole story in, you know, so many words yet picture books, most of them and what publishing houses want are under 800 words. Well, my Willoughby's first um, Willoughby and the Terribly Itchy Itch was um, less than 500 words, like 492. So it can, you can do a whole story in, you know, less than a thousand, less than 500. Yeah. Catherine? I was just going to reiterate the part of using your flash fiction for chapters in your book. They can be really good inspirations for your novel. They can be really good, uh, spicy, you know, um, challenging chapters that, you know, the where, where you're and a good way to do flash fiction is just to randomly pull three words out of a box and then write around those three words. Mm -hmm. I like that idea. I like photo prompts too. Um, I used to help with a photo prompt contest that the Florida uh, American Christian Fiction Writers Chapter put on for three or four years and would send out the photo. And it was amazing that the stories, and they were of course short stories um, that they would write about these based on a photo and how different they would be. I mean, the same photo would just generate such interesting um, stories. Yeah, photo, picture prompts, photo prompts, they're, they're a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Cassandra Ham on Instagram often runs contests of nanofiction, 52 100 word stories based on a picture prompt or a concept prompt. And those are, they're fun and they're challenging. And you get something finished fast and i can't tell you that's a rush for a writer to finish a story to have a new idea i love it you've done those challenges right like for a 30-day challenge or something like that that you were you were doing that and putting them on instagram i did i did a um a 50 word fiction challenge for october mm -hmm. and i wrote it was the first one i took up and i wrote 31 50 word stories um and i Learned how to use Canva and <laughs> um, pixels. <laughs> it kind of made that my course on on those things, and it was fun. And then I published it for my family. So now I can say, not only am I published, but I'm self-published. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, Kat. Oh, Catherine was talking in the chat. So I'm just going to read it that her writing group would host word wars and we're oh. doing word war three when we stop not flash fiction but two minute writes around two to three words drawn randomly yeah it's, it just you know sometimes I'll run across like a sheet of paper that's tucked away somewhere and it will be where I've been to some place where they've said you know here's your prompt and go and I personally don't like those things because I need time to think <laughs> they don't give you time to think but but it it is amazing that sometimes I'll read that and think you know what that's that, there's some something good there that's not as horrible as I remember it being and you know it's like maybe I could do something with it so that's that is kind of fun and it's I will reiterate it's encouraging flash fiction I find to be a great way to rediscover your love for words. Yeah. Sometimes when we're in the middle of a big edit or submissions and we're not hearing back or we are hearing back, <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to um, mm. it's nice just to play in the sandbox a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay, so here's a current contest. The link is in there for those of you watching the replay. 
what does it say for iowa.org is that am i reading that right slash right hyphen now so you might want to check that one out a 100 word micro story and then Catherine is talking about what um, Pam said earlier that many children's stories are under a thousand words and asks, is there anything besides length that makes flash fiction? So she's got flash in quotation marks. Is that final twist an inviolable element? Um, and she says that your examples could serve as the opening sections of longer stories, even novels. And yeah, that that is true. So, yeah, so yeah. I want to note um, that contest there, that um, 100 word micro story, it says in the um, guidelines that it is for UI alumni, students, faculty, staff. Oh, it does say and friends. So I'm guessing friends will be accepted as well. Then I caught the friends at the tail end when I was reading it just now. Well, maybe you have to send in a donation to be a friend. I don't know. Yeah, perhaps that could be. That runs from July 6th to the 20th, it says. But check it. You can check it out. But let's go back to Catherine's. Uh, do you want to respond to her questions? Um, I would think that, and Pam, you could probably clarify, I would think that in children's stories, when they're short, they actually want a little bit more exposition. They want the children, they don't want the children to jump in without any warning to a crisis. Um, I'm thinking of the children. Sometimes, sometimes it depends, like anything depends on the story. Um, the difference with children's books is because they're fully illustrated is mm -hmm. you don't need hardly any description of anything because stuff's shown in the illustrations. So. I, I think what uh, Catherine was asking now, I mean, I think that was a comment, but then she went on to questions is, is what besides length makes flash fiction, flash fiction. And is that final twist necessary to good flash fiction? Yes. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> and Catherine had asked earlier too, have you seen examples of flash fiction where they had a happy twist at the end instead of, you know, that? Absolutely. Um, one of the stories that I read from the 1916 book of flash fictions, the story is of a a doctor who needs a trans blood for a patient he's operating on. And the patient's brother comes into the room and the, the doctor is so occupied in trying to save her life, he sends his friend to convince him to give a blood transfusion to save his sister's life. And so the boy agrees and at the very end, he, the girl's life is saved and the boy says so when am i going to croak and the doctor looks at his friend and says did you not explain this to him and the the friend didn't understand because you're not going to die you saved your sister's life but you're going to live and would you have done it otherwise i mean he was surprised that the boy would would risk his life to save his sisters and she says of course i would she's my sister and that's a very heartwarming end. Um, Trumpet Blues, which I actually wrote during a prompt session in writer's chat when I started there, um, that starts out with a very busy executive woman who is very self-absorbed, self-centered, and has little patience for anyone. And she keeps stressing about time. Does she have time for this? She doesn't have time for that, blah, blah, blah. At the very end, she runs into a lost love who is a mus musician at Berkeley, and she asks how life has treated him. He says, it's a long story. And her answer is, I've got time. And I don't develop the relationship any further than them meeting later in life. Um, but you have that turnaround of her whole attitude, her whole agenda changes because her heart is touched again. So there are often very happy endings, very sweet stories within flash fiction. Um, let's see. That was a good one. I like, <laughs> I like that one, Sophia. It was really, it was very sweet. Thank you. 
it actually got a good review. It was my very first Amazon review, so I was happy. Be kicked out of an and an all and that ugh, what do they call them? Anthology. Mm -hmm. And have that story picked out as their favorite one in the anthology. It was just fine. That's fine. So um, I'm going to read this to you from one of my resources. This was from something that Blue Ridge had put out on flash fiction writing. Um, no, actually, that's not it. Here it is. Okay. Okay. You're flash fiction. And there's more than this, but it should have a plot. It has to be a complete story. It's not an anecdote. Anecdote. It has to have characters. It has to have a perspective that you're viewing life from. Um, one flash fiction we put out was actually a series of, um, what do they call them? Notices from a company saying, don't do this, do this. And they were just constantly correcting themselves about what, but through the notices, a story unfolded of an invasion. It was very interesting. It was all written in second person, which is a challenge, um, but they kept your interest. I think the first one was don't feed. It was like, don't feed this. And then if you did feed this, immediately go to these people and they will help you. And oh, wait, no, that's not going to work. And so they had this continuing um, outline of how things went wrong. And I can't remember what the kind of notice that is. If anybody helps me, that would be great. Like when you get something from a company that tells you how to use your thing, and then they change their mind. They say, oh, no, don't do that. Do this, or you'll blow up your house. So nobody wants to blow up their house. Um, but you need a plot, you need characters, you need a hook. You do need a slam bang finish. Um, it, it's okay if your story has lingering questions, but it does need an, a finish, like a joke. Um, doesn't have to be funny. And then, um, so that is, um, that, those are some of the basic ingredients for flash fiction. I'll put the link for where I got that information. Um, I'll put two links that I did some research in. Boom. Catherine mentioned the text message stories. We've talked about that. Somebody talked about this once before in Writer's Chat, not too long ago, it seems like. And wasn't there a specific name for those stories? But it's uh, it's not coming back to me what they are. Yeah, Hope Bowling you talked about it in her novels that she was actually writing. Yeah, they did it in text message style. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And yeah, it's just like one text message after the other. And yeah, there was a name for it, but it escapes me. <laughs> so that yeah that's a that's a neat way to to tell a story and I and I think I've told you guys this that in one of my short stories was all images I mean there were words in the images because one was a birth certificate one was a report card bus tickets things like that but but the images themselves told a story and that was a really fun thing to put together to see if I could tell a story using paper it was called ephemera, which, you know, that's, or it was called paper trail, but it was about ephemera. I actually put up an article on writing a good first page. And a lot of that applies to your flash fiction story, which is only going to be about three pages. <laughs> well, anyone else have any comments or questions or stories that they would like to, to tell us about real quick. Flash fiction experiences. All right. Well, we are so glad, Sophia. Thank you so much. This was very, very interesting and, and inspiring. I, I just, I love the idea of just writing, um, writing short because I don't get the chance to do that very often and it's, and it is fun. 
Uh, Jeannie, like I said, before we started the recording, Jean Wise is going to be here next week. She's going to be talking about doing um, surveys for readers. Jean has been doing her blog, uh, healthyspirituality.org, since about 2008, 2009. I mean, she got in kind of early and has been very consistent. She knew her theme and knew her message. And, and so she has done different um, surveys with her readers over the years to help her fine tune her blog and fine tune what message, you know, to be putting out on it. Um, so she's got a wealth of experience doing that, a wealth of knowledge. So she's going to be on here next week to share that. Um, July 5th is a Tuesday that we are not going to be meeting. We, you know, I say often, you know, we meet every Tuesday morning and that's not quite true. We do miss some of the holiday weeks and, and that's going to be one of them. Some of us are going to be gone. Um, so we just decided it was best to just to give you all a break. So enjoy July 4th and you've got July 5th that Tuesday morning to recuperate from your July 4th festivities if you need it. Um, if you're watching the replay, we do invite you to be with us most Tuesday mornings, 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Central, right here on Writers Chat. We'd love to have you and also to check out our Facebook Writers Group, um, Writers Chat group and our Writers Chat page where you can find all of our past episodes and they're also available, of course, on our YouTube channel. So I will say goodbye and stop the recording, but everybody's welcome to stay for the after party. Bye-bye, folks. <laughs>